Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering IBM Edge 2015, brought to you by IBM. Welcome back to Las Vegas, everybody. This is The Cube, this is IBM Edge 2015. I'm Dave Vellante with Stu Miniman. John Tuigo is here. He's the managing partner of Tuigo Partners International, consultant extraordinaire, storage guru, and uh, provocative dude, uh, and also the pen and pen and teller of storage. John, <laughs> great to see you again. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here again. So uh, this is uh, your third edge, I think, our third edge. Yep, um, actually I've been here since the very first one in Orlando. Right, yeah, us two, and I've, I've said frequently, as it relates to IBM storage business, it's got to shrink to grow. Well, they got the shrink part down, yes. they've done that, it's sort of the systems business is rationalized, jettisoned the x86 kind of out of the Gerstner playbook, and um, have we hit bottom? Uh, has IBM hit bottom? Uh, let's wait and see, I, I'm looking to see, I would say the big announcement that they made, other than tape, which went to 220 terabytes on an LTO cartridge, uh, just about a month ago. Yep. Um, uh, I would say the other big announcement that they've made is uh, sort of the rebranding of uh, a lot of their storage product line into Spectrum. So, uh, you know, their software-defined storage is actually XIV software off the XIV array, which is now a Spectrum product. Um, they have Spectrum Accelerate, which I believe incorporates their Flash stuff. Uh, they have Spectrum Archive and Spectrum Protect. Uh, that's very interesting. I, I made a little quip about it in a blog recently. I said, you know, there are a lot of ways to talk about integrated technology, and one way is just list all the products on the same brochure, and it's integrated at the brochure level. I'm, I'm hoping that we're integrated beyond the brochure level, and well, well, I'm, we were, I'm here to find that out. We were at EMC last week, and, and uh, somebody joked, the only, only time the products all come together is on, on the PO. And so, <laughs> and so that was a pretty funny line. That's true, and it's also, um, it comes together when they're packaged up the company for sale. It, it, yeah. But it's not just EMC, right? Yes. I mean, this is sort of a symptom of, of our entire business. So, sure. okay, so IBM's, from a storage perspective, sort of redoing the portfolio. Jamie Thomas, now in charge, he's a software executive. Um, you're sanguine about the software-defined strategy. Yeah, actually, I've been tracking software-defined for a long time. To me, uh, there are a couple of different ways to look at it. One, one obviously, is that it's a back-to-the-future moment, okay? I mean, when I first started in this business 30 years ago, it was a mainframe, and SMS, System Managed Storage, was what we were working with. So we had these dumb direct-attached devices called DASD, and we had all this chewy goodness of the value-add software was in a software layer that lived on the operating system of the mainframe. Now we're back to the future, we're going back to that model again. Um, I'd say that the one thing that has me a little concerned is that um, for all of the, 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 I think, intelligent engineering that's being done to migrate uh, value-add software off the array controller and stick it in a layer of software on the, the server itself, um, they're ignoring, in most cases, capacity, capacity management, that functionality staying on the array controller. That's a huge mistake. I mean, if you look at what Datacore software is doing, uh, uh, they virtualize the capacity. You look at SAN volume controller from IBM together with the XIV software, they join those together, they've got, they've virtualized the, the storage capacity as well as all the services that go with it. So you talk about back to the future, you use system managed storage as an example. Right. But part of the drawback of, as I recall, the system managed storage, you would physically allocate a data set to a class of storage, right. and then if things changed, you'd have to manually reallocate. So there wasn't that sort of intelligence. Is that changing? Uh, actually, I, I think that uh, we're talking about a slightly different era, though. Maybe that was the 70s. In the 80s, we saw DFHSM, and we saw the migration of data based on uh, whatever parameters you associated with that data. Age from or... Yeah, uh, date last access, date last modified, whatever. Uh, and you'd move it from one tier of storage to another. The thing that really has me concerned right now is I look at all the woo around hyper-converged infrastructure, you know, where you, you take a commodity server and commodity storage and you glue them together with some software-defined storage and you sell it as an appliance, right? Um, what they're doing is uh, that and maybe Hadoop, they're flattening out the storage infrastructure. There's just one speed of storage, one capacity of storage, and that's for everything. And how do you tier in an environment like that? I mean, I've never uh, thought that tiering was a, a solution as good as Archive, 
but we're going to have to get a lot smarter about how we do this. Now, you look at a product, an object storage product, like a Coringo. Coringo has something they call Darkive, and Darkive takes uh, you know, this, uh, uh, the data that's gone to sleep, moves it to a set of spindles, and then spins those spindles down. I don't know that I love that, but it's better than nothing, and it's sort of a shelter-in-place idea. Okay, we're going to have to start thinking in those terms for virtually all of our data if we go to a flat infrastructure model. Yeah, so John, actually, if I could respond to the hyperconverge piece, yeah. I think it gets boiled down a little bit too much to the clients, and many customers will, especially in the mid-range, you right. know, buy a couple of nodes and do that, right. but you know, our, our vision for that space is really, you're cr creating a new platform for storage, the services can be layered on top of that, uh, you've got, you know, many of them are flash and disk, some are doing some all flash, um, but it is, you know, really allowing you to flexibly, you know, add and remove components and services and applications, uh, almost like, uh, you know, you probably don't like the term cloud, but it's, uh, you know, to, trying to make it simple as opposed to, you know, saying, okay, I, I've got some infrastructure and I need to upgrade it, I need to, you know, migrate to the new thing. It's, it's, it's really kind of, you know, we called it server sand, which was taking that old early benefits of network storage and just bringing it closer to the compute layer, but a scalable, really distributed architecture is what we say it's need, that it happens to come in an appliance format today it is just what makes sense, but it's things like, you know, .NET, you know, storage services for Microsoft uh, and, and others that are you know going to make this kind of new generation of of, of storage uh, devices. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I I don't disagree with that uh, concept at all. Uh, I think that anything we can do that will drive cost out of the storage infrastructure and drive efficiency up is a good thing. Um, I think that there's still a, a debate that needs to be had about what services must still persist at the array controller level. I don't think we've really gotten to the end of that yet. It might be something as simple as uh, RAID or as simple as erasure coding needs to be done close to the data. Uh, I, you know, that's a question that has yet to be answered. I think it's a good subject for a paper. What I look for right now when I look at hyperconverged are two things, and that is, one, am I flexible in terms of what workload I can support? Right now, most of the hyperconverged products that are out there are isolated behind a specific hypervisor. So you're going to have a proprietary stack of technology behind VMware, a proprietary stack of technology behind Hyper-V. Although I was at a Microsoft Ignite last week and a Microsoft guy said, oh no, 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 we're open. And I said, really, you're open? And they said, yeah, we're open. You can take those VMDK files yeah. and migrate them right over into the Hyper-V uh, <laughs> software-defined storage pool, cluster storage spaces, we give you a little utility that converts them from VMDK into VHD. Yeah, <laughs> Which is essentially open. importing in. them yeah. into... The door's, uh, open. The, the door's always open for your application <laughs> yeah. to come your way. But an interesting point, you yeah. know, you, you mentioned, you know, Microsoft's been pretty open lately. They're doing a lot with Linux. Right. You know, Azure's pretty open. I mean, right. we're, we're here at an IBM show. I mean, IBM, I still remember when they put billion dollars down at Linux. Agreed. Uh, you know, Microsoft's doing pretty good in open these days. I, I agree, I agree. And uh, the other thing that I see as an encouraging sign is, uh, Nutanix, which used to be sort of an exclusive VMware play. I don't know if they had a falling out with, with Master Blaster or what, but the, 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 they've now announced they're going to have their own little hypervisor sitting on top of their storage rig. So instead of migrating all the software-defined storage over to uh, the server side, we migrate the server down to the, to the, the storage. Well, Evo Rail, right? When, yeah, when we, that when was, that was announced, Of course, the, the, all the guys from Nutanix and other hyper-converged guys would say, hey, that's that's validation. Well, behind the scenes, they were like, hey, that's fighting words. Strategically, yeah. that is a concern of mine, is can I support all workload? Because we already know we're going to have, if you believe Gartner and IDC, we're going to have 75% uh, of applications virtualized uh, by the end of the year, okay? And another 25% that are high performance transaction processing stuff that nobody wants to virtualize. Yeah. So you've got at least two different storage targets now, two different work sets, two different data sets that are going to have to be protected, uh, 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 hosted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and you take the flip side of that, uh, the survey data that was started coming out last year, and we discovered that uh, in 80% of cases, you know, companies that were surveyed said that they were going to uh, diversify their hypervisors. So now they're going to have more than one hypervisor. Now we're going to have multiple stacks of data that we have to manage and no common way to do it. That's ridiculous, okay? So what I'm looking for are the SDS guys that will play, uh, the hyperconverged solutions that will play across multiple workloads. Horizontal, yeah. And then I also want to see on the, the Y-axis, if you will, uh, hardware flexibility. I don't want to be joined at the hip to proprietary hardware. You look at EvoRail, which you mentioned, You've got a, 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 a set of hardware selections. You can have it in any color as long as it's black. 
yep. okay, um, versus uh, you know a Starwind or a, uh, somebody else, uh, any of the third-party guys who are pretty much open. They're trying to embrace the broadest range. Well, they kind of have to be, right? I mean, why not? <laughs> why not? They don't have a proprietary install base. Well, now Hyperconverge works for them because all the server vendors who've been getting their butts kicked as commodity product are now trying to join in alliances with anybody who'll join with them to create their little appliance for Hyperconverge. So you got Huawei making a deal with Datacore, and you got um, uh, uh, Xbyte Technologies now doing a deal with Starwind. Um, you got uh, everybody and his kid sister lining up to get in the process for being certified for HP and for Cisco UCS and for Lenovo. So uh, everybody wants to be relevant. This may provide the glue that will allow them yeah. all to come back. Yeah, if I can come back, you, you brought up a really interesting point that seems to be overlooked uh, by, by most, is that most of the hyper-converged exclusions are tied to that virtualized workload. Yep. And there are plenty of workloads, uh, you know, not just certain legacy workloads, but some things like Hadoop that we're not virtualizing today, and therefore I need bare metal. When IBM bought SoftLayer, that was one of the things that was a little bit compelling, is right. you know, it, it's physical. I can do virtualization if I want, I can do something else, uh, and that it does tend to get glossed over a bit. I get it. And, and frankly, that's where all my research and my attention is going these days, because it seems to be the only area of momentum in storage right now. I, I know Flash is still out there, but Flash has suddenly gotten sane. You know, I mean, uh, you talk to Eric Eiberg here from IBM. Uh, Eric isn't pushing Flash uh, as the solution to everything, you know? Well, well, well go ahead. No, I, 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 I would say early on there was a lot of oversell. Uh, Flash was being posited as the, you know, the 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 reincarnation of the savior or something, okay. which is totally fa uh, false. Uh, if I'm going to do, a, for example, a, a write buffer, I'm not going to use Flash for that. I'm going to use DRAM for that because it writes faster than Flash does, and we just have to simply acknowledge that. Uh, also, I would mention just tying it back to hyperconverged and software defined, uh, Flash is terribly misused by both VMware and by Microsoft currently. They're not optimized to use Flash probably. In the case of uh, Microsoft, when they do their deduplication process, they write it to Flash, and then they're doing all the small block uh, uh, fixes to the data set, and they're hammering the Flash over and over and over again with small block writes, and it's yeah. like, how do we burn out Flash? You know, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's do it Well, faster. we'll take care of that with wear leveling. Yeah. But, okay, but so Flash, let's talk about the economics of Flash, which right. are starting to get really interesting when you, not only deduplication and, 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 and compression, which everybody talks about, but the data sharing aspects of it. In other words, the number of copies that you don't have to create physical copies on different storage devices that you can serve out of, out of Flash. A lot of people think that Flash is going to be less expensive than virtually any spinning disk. Already is less expensive at the high end. So back to your point about tiering, why not have just a flash layer and a bit bucket one way trip to tape land? I, I, I've uh, suggested that I think on our last program together. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to be one of these t uh, disc is dead guys any more than I want to be a tape is dead guy or a flash is dead guy. Mm -hmm. I think there's room for everybody in all these things. Um, you know what we do basically we use uh, in particularly storage technology we use it as a mechanism to uh, a spoof. Okay, that's what it's really all about. There are only two ways to speed things up. The real way, parallelization, or the phony way, spoofing, making it look like it got faster. NetApp's been doing it for years. You know, they stick a PAM card or a, or a, a memory chip in front of the disk in the back because the disk is slow. So you write your data and it says, okay, we got it. Actually, it just wrote it to a memory buffer before and it's waiting in turn. It really doesn't go. have it. Yeah, it's got but, a bottleneck waiting to happen. Exactly, but what, what they basically have is a spoof going on, okay? Uh, we were doing it in mainframes with channel extension for years. You know, you write to a device locally that pretends to be the device you're writing to. It's actually an emulation, writes it across a WAN. There's a device on the other end, it pretends to be the mainframe, and it writes to the local devices that are attached. Uh, that's spoofing, okay? And there's nothing wrong with spoofing. It's a time-honored engineering tradition. And that's a role, <laughs> that's a role that Flash has, uh, 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 I think, been used for optimally uh, in a lot of respects. Flash has really kind of become a spoofing layer. And just as disk was prior to that, in front of tape, we were writing to disk first because tape was a little slower to take the write. Uh, not not so much anymore. I mean, I, I'd say di uh, tape is probably faster than everything except flash, right? Yeah, Maybe. that's right. It's yeah. a time to last bite, right? You know, it's going to be faster on tape if you put it. It's a buffer properly. But so, but you talk about Back to the Future. I think of uh, MVSXA and expanded storage, and the problem was it wasn't persistent. Right now, with Flash as a memory extension, you actually can get a persistent version of expanded storage, if you will. Do you think that has potential? I, I do, and uh, uh, frankly, I see Flash being inserted into a lot of roles 
where it simply provides that buffer, it provides the additional space uh, to allow other componentry to catch up. And it basically keeps your, your, your uh, infrastructure synchronized with the latest speeds and feeds requirements of the workload. What I really look for though in storage, and I think people are, uh, you know, the economy may be showing signs of turning around, but I think people are still very nervous about what stuff costs. And to a certain extent, the flash numbers look very appealing, they look uh, 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 enticing. But I think the bigger issue is software-defined storage. Uh, you know, when I look back at the original data domain deduplication rig, it was 300 one terabyte hard drives, cost 79 bucks a piece on Newegg, and they were selling the rig for $410,000 because it had this wonderful, chewy, goodness value-add deduplication software sitting on it, right? Um, it's ridiculous, and that had to change. So if we can take all that chewy goodness stuff that the vendors were using to artificially prop up the price of commodity exactly. gear, yeah. extract it out, and throw it into a software layer, I think we're doing doing the Lord's work. And give me an API system. until I can programmatically you know, manage. Exactly, well, I don't want an API, I want REST. You want REST, yeah, yeah. Right, absolutely. So I know that's formulated as an API in most yeah, cases, yeah, right. but you know, unfortunately it hasn't really been jumped on with the vigor that one would expect, mainly because hardware vendors see no value in, yeah, in well, improving common management, right? All right, John, uh, we're out of time, but I, I love having you on as a guest. You can really, you connect the dots in, in the business. Uh, you pay attention to the little, little guys and where the innovation is actually happening and try to push that you know, on the larger guys and help customers you know, see the way through. So thanks very much for coming on Thank and sharing your much. insights. I appreciate the opportunity. All right, keep it right there, buddy. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from Edge 2015. We'll be right back. So theCUBE has been called the ESPN of tech, and really our vision is to cover every event that's out there. We really 